Hello everyone and welcome to the channel. In this video I will talk about improvements I've made to the EEPROM programmer, namely adding support for data verification and write protection, as well as some memory diagnostics I've added to the BIOS. I hope you enjoy! So the first thing I want to do is be able to reset the computer from the TNC monitor. So that's going to be quite easy because the TNC already has access to the manual reset pin. So in our loop where we parse the commands, I'm going to add a case for reset. And that's going to be with R. And it's going to call a reset computer function. And this is the reset computer function. It basically writes a zero to manual reset, waits for one nap and then writes a one to manual reset again. And so that should reset the computer. So let's upload this to the TNC. So if I hit R and send, Okay, so the reason why I was seeing some weird characters here is because I had another instance of Minicom connected to the same terminal. So of course that doesn't work. So if I close it and retry, now we see hello world properly. Nice. Let me add a new line and upload it to the computer. Okay, so now this is not working because apparently it's connecting to the same USB modem as the MCP2221A, so I have to fix that. So this line here obviously is not going to work because it's only going to find the first USB modem in the list. So I move this to a script, eprom.sh, and this is the contents of eprom.sh. You can see it uses IORAG to find the TNC. Unfortunately, the TNC is named USB Serial, which is not a great name, but it works. And then it does the upload. So let's try again. So I actually need to send both a courage return and a new line. There we go. Okay. So now the next thing I want to do is implement verification during programming. So I want to make sure that every byte that I program is read back by the TNC to make sure that it was programmed correctly. So let's do this now. So I have updated the handle programming function so that after programming bytes at an address and verifying that the page write has finished using data polling, we verify that all bytes have been written correctly just by reading all the bytes in the packet again. So if we take a look at the read byte at address function, it's pretty simple. We set the address bus to the right value. We start pulsing the read pen low and we wait for three knobs. That's enough to satisfy the data access time and the address decoding time. Uh, and then we read the data from the data bus and finish the read pulse. So this is how we read from an arbitrary address. And we then do for every address in a single Intel hex packet. We read the byte and we verify that the read data is equal to what's in the buffer. If it's not, we print a an error to the log saying that we failed verification. And after that, we can finish reading from the ROM. And I've extracted two functions here, start read from ROM and end read from ROM. And those just set the data bus to input and read to output. So we can now upload this to the TNC and verify that it still works. So it's now programming and verifying at the same time, so it's a bit longer. And then we can see that the program still works. So now just to be sure, let's change this to verify that we are still programming this correctly. And there we go. So in order to test this fully, I want to find a case where verification fails. But before we can do that, we have to make a change actually in our programming algorithm. And that's the fact that we're using data polling here to pull for the end of write. If the last byte that we have written hasn't been written correctly, 
this call here is never going to finish because it's always going to wait for this last byte to be written correctly. And so we're never going to reach here the verification. In fact, if we look at the data polling here, we have a loop here that waits for the expected data to be the data that we read. And so if this byte is not written correctly, then this loop is never going to return. So that's the reason why there are two different ways to detect the end of a write cycle. So if we look at the data sheet for the EEPROM, we can see here that we can do data polling to indicate the end of a write cycle. We can also do toggle bit. And so that's another method to determine the end of a write cycle. And it says that during the write operation, successive attempts to read from the device will result in pen number six on the data bus toggling between one and zero. Once the write is completed, the pin number six will stop toggling and valid data will be read. So in the case that we have written an incorrect byte, we can still use toggle bit to check when the write operation is finished because it will just stop toggling at some point and it's independent from reading the correct byte. So we have to switch from data polling to toggle bit. So let me do that now. Okay, so I've switched to checking the toggle bit here to pull for the end of write. It's now independent from the actual byte content at this address. And if we look at the check toggle bit function, we now see that this function is looping until the data that we read has bit number six, the same for two successive attempts. So while it's not the same, while it's, it's toggling for each read attempt, we keep looping here and then we read the byte at the address and we only look at byte number six here and this is going to toggle and when it stops toggling we stop trying to check the toggle bit. So we can now try to make the verification fail and it's not going to stay in this infinite loop forever. So now the question is how do we trigger a fault in the verification? So we could potentially find a way to maybe unplug some wire from the EEPROM, maybe in the data bus, or switch some wires around, something like that. But there is another way that we can do that, and that's enabling write protection on the EEPROM. So if write protection is enabled on the EEPROM, any attempt to write to it, of course, is going to fail. And so we're never going to see updated data in the EEPROM. So if I take the EEPROM as it is to the computer and program it with write protection enabled and we try to program it again, we're going to fail verification. So let me try this now. So in my make file, I'm going to stop disabling write protection here when I program with MiniPro. And I'm going to put the EEPROM in the programmer and programming it like this. Okay, so as you can see, it has turned on the write protection. So let me put it back in the circuit. And now if I reset the computer, it still works. It prints Hello YouTube. So if I change this back to Hello World and program the EEPROM, we now see that it has reset. It still prints Hello YouTube. And here I have some fail verifications. And the reason why is write protection is now enabled on the EEPROM. And so, of course, any write is going to fail. And it's only raising file verifications at addresses where we wanted to modify the contents. So now the next step is to implement write protection handling. So disabling write protection at the beginning of a programming session and enabling it again after we have programmed the EEPROM. And if we look at the data sheet for the EEPROM again, we can see that in the software data protection section, we can enable software data protection using a series of three write commands. So we have to write three specific bytes of data to three specific addresses. And then after that, the entire ROM will be protected against inadvertent write operations. And once write protection is set, it will remain active unless the disable command sequence is issued. And it says here that we have to see below for the algorithm. And this is the software data protection enable and disable algorithm. 
in order to disable data protection, we have to write AA to address 5555, then 55 to address 2AAA, then 80 to address 5555, then AA to 5555 again, and 55 to 2AAA again, and then 20 to 5555. And then at this point, the data protection is disabled. Then to enable it again, we have to write AA to address 5555, 55 to 2 AAA, A0 to 5555. And then after that, it will enter data protection state. So let's implement this in our Arduino monitor. So I've added two new functions, enable write protection and disable write protection. And those are basically implementing the various writes that are required as per the datasheet. Yeah, this is quite simple. We do have to remember to add the RAM offset to the addresses uh, because, of course, RAM address 0 in our computer starts at 8000 hex. I'm making use of this function here. When I start programming, I disable the write protection and then as I finish programming, I enable write protection again. Okay, so let's test this. I'm going to try to write this again, and we now shouldn't be having any verification issues. Uh, of course, I have to upload the new code to the Teensy. And there we go. The code has successfully been updated, and we have no error here in the terminal. That's great. As you can see here, we are just using cat to send the Intel hex file to the TNC, but we are not actually monitoring whether the programming is successful or if there are any errors. As you saw in the previous sequence, I was looking at the serial monitor in the TNC to check for error logs, but it would be nice if those error logs were directly reported in my IDE when I was programming the computer. So what I will do is I'll move this to a Python script that will, at the same time, upload the Intel hex file to the TNC and read from the TNC any error messages. This way I don't have to leave my IDE when programming. So let me do that now. So this is the Python script I came up with. Let me walk you through it. The first thing it does is use AREG again to get the specific device corresponding to the Teensy. And then it opens a serial connection to that port over here. Then this is going to be a multi-threaded program. So we're using the process class to start two different threads. One is going to be responsible for programming the EEPROM and the other one is going to be responsible for reading the status. We want this to be multi-threaded because those two things happen concurrently. As we send data to the TNC, it reports status information and we want to display that in real time. And so what this does is start the two threads, wait for them to terminate and then check that they exited without error. Now the first thread is programming the EEPROM. And what this does is take a file as argument and then read it. And for each byte that it reads, send it to the TNC. So this is pretty simple. And then we have a read status thread that will loop until either the done string is in the output or the errors during programming string is in the output from the TNC. I also updated the TNC code so that at the beginning it prints programming and then at the end, if there was any errors, it prints the string, otherwise it prints done. Let's try it out. So let's upload this to the TNC. I'll use eprom.sh to verify that nothing broke. You can see it's doing the same thing as before and there's no output, but if we look at the serial monitor, we have the new uh, programming output here. So now if I switch my make file to use the new code, now it's calling the program.py. There we can see that the output appears um, in our terminal. Now there is an issue here because the serial terminal is also connected on the Arduino IDE side and of course we can't have multiple terminals reading from the same port. So we have to remember to close this one before programming. 
Let's try again. And it works. Now, let's check what happens if there's an error. In order to have some error messages appear here, I will comment out the disable write protection here in the TNC so that the programming fails. I have to make a change to my program so that the verification actually fails. Let me just remove world from L world, compile it, and try to program. And now we can see the failed verification log messages and also the binary exits with a non-zero status. So that's great. Now we can be confident that if there's any programming error, we'll actually see it in our IDE. Okay, so we've added this uh, programming algorithm to our TNC. We can now program the EEPROM integrated in our computer quite easily. But what if something goes wrong with this algorithm? I mean, I'm not perfect. I'm not immune from making errors. Maybe there's something wrong with this that I haven't encountered yet. How can I make sure that what gets into my EEPROM is actually valid code? We've been computing checksums at the packet level, which means that at least we are sure that the packets that the TNC receives are correct, but there's nothing preventing, for example, losing a packet or not being able to program a packet that we've received correctly, even though the, the TNC has it in memory. Ideally, what we would like is for the computer itself to be able to self-check the integrity of its code. There are a couple ways we can do that, but the easiest is to add a checksum byte to the ROM. This way, the computer can calculate the sum of all the bytes in the ROM, and if the sum is correct, then it knows that the code it's executing is also correct. And that's not a new idea, it's actually something that I saw on the 6502 forums, and which I'm just adapting here to my own computer. So what we can do is add a checksum word here at the end of the EEPROM. And I'm using words because it's going to be easier for the computer to compute a sum using 16-bit access, since it is a 16-bit capable microprocessor. So all the way at the end, before the interrupt vectors, there's going to be two bytes here that represent the checksum. During the build process, I'm going to compute the sum of all the words in the ROM, and I'm going to update this word here so that the total sum of the ROM is equal to zero. This way it's easy to check if the computer does a sum of all the words in the ROM and it finds something different than zero, then maybe there's an issue with the programming or maybe even the circuit or the breadboard. It's not going to be too useful to check the functionality of the physical circuits because uh, if there's a connection that is broken to the ROM or something like that, it's highly unlikely that the computer is going to be able to even execute the checksum code to be able to check the ROM. But it will add a layer of safety to programming. So in order to compute this checksum, I have a Python script here that I'm not going to go into too many details because this is not a Python channel. You can take a look at this on my GitHub repository and it's a pretty simple piece of code. What happens is it opens the binary file, computes the checksum. If the checksum is zero, then there's nothing to do. Otherwise, it computes the sum byte. That's going to be the difference between 2 to the power of 16 and the checksum that we got. And then it will seek to the address of the checksum and then write it to the file and then close. And then in order to compute the checksum, we'll just do a simple sum. Uh, there are more complicated algorithms that you could use for the checksum that might be able to catch more errors than a simple sum, but those will be more complex to implement on the 658.16. If you think about Fletcher, for example, or something more complex like a CRC, here a simple sum is going to be pretty simple to start us with. And then I've added this checksum script to our makefile so that just after we call the assembler, we update the checksum in the binary. So let's try this. So you can see here after calling make that it computed that the checksum of the binary file is 44C7 and thus it's setting the sum word uh, to BB39 at the address 
uh, this way the sum is zero. And if we look at the Intel hex file, all the way here at the end of the file here, we can see that it's set the checksum byte here. So now if I go back to our assembly code, I've added a diagnostic for the ROM. Uh, so diagnostic number one is actually already in there because the first thing we do when we boot the CPU is put it into native mode. If the emulation LED stays on, then we know that it's not reaching this piece of code here, and so there's probably something wrong with the circuit itself. And so now the second diagnostic is right after booting, we'll compute the checksum of the ROM and verify that it is zero. So for that, we switch the registers to 16 bits in order to do the sum quicker. Then it's a simple loop containing an add with carry indexed by the X register here, and then we compare it to zero. After that, we set the CPU back to eight bits because that's the default I'm using uh, right now in the rest of the code. And if the checksum is not correct, we need a way to communicate this to the user. However, at this point, we can't assume that anything else is functioning in the circuit because there's an error with the ROM. It's, it's not true that we can use the VIA or the serial link here because maybe the drivers for those are corrupted in the ROM, so we don't really know. Uh, and so I have a very simple error output here, which is I'm going to blink the emulation LED uh, on and off just to tell the user that there's something wrong with the ROM. And so in order to do that, I did a delay loop that repeatedly exchange the carry bits with the emulation bits. This is going to turn on and off the emulation LED. And in order for it to be at a visible frequency, we have to add some delays. And I've computed that to be a 200 millisecond period by cycle counting this loop here. Okay, so now let's try it. Let me program the ROM. I'm going to open Minicam here. All right, so we can see that the code is still working. It's still printing hello world. In order to test this, we have to generate an issue with this checksum. So what I'll do is I will update the code in some way. We can just say hello here, and I'm going to compile it. And now I will open the Intel hex file, and I will remove the last packet here that contains the new checksum to be programmed. This way, when I now program the EEPROM, it's still going to have the old checksum here. And of course, the verification will fail. So let's try it. And there we go. As you can see, the emulation LED is turned on. It's blinking, and we don't have any output here in the serial monitor. This means that the computer has stopped here, telling us that there's an integrity problem with the code. So now if I compile it again to get the proper checksum and program it, it's now executing properly, and we have our hello here. All right, that's great. I kind of got tired of cycle counting these delay loops. We have one here, and we also have one here in the ACIA code, and there's probably gonna be more. So I went and created some macros, and macros in ACME are some functions that you can call in a language at a higher level than assembly, and that's going to help you do calculations and generate assembly codes automatically. So if you take, for example, this macro here, which I've called delay small microseconds, it's going to be a delay loop using one register, the X register, and the argument is going to be dynamic, it's going to be microseconds, and the macro will automatically compute the number of cycles in this loop based on the microsecond delay that we want. So, of course, this is all based on the CPU speed, which I've set here at 4 MHz, and this is going to be used to do the conversion between time units and number of cycles. So delay small is using one loop, so it can go up to approximately 256 microseconds at 4 megahertz, which is quite small. So we can increase the amount of delay that we get by adding more registers here in this loop. So I've created also delay medium microseconds, which can go up to 65 milliseconds. And this uses two registers, X and Y, to do the delay loop. And finally, I have a delay large, that could go up to 16 seconds 
by using three registers, A, X, and Y. As you can see, the calculations for the higher number of registers can get a bit complicated, so I'm not going to go into detail into all of those. Feel free to look at the code in the GitHub repository. I'll just explain how the small delay loop works, and you can apply the same principles to get the larger delay functions. So the way this works is I have counted the number of cycles that this takes. It's going to be the line here. So the cycle is going to be two, and that's the load x with x set to one, so we're in eight bit indexes, plus the number of loops multiplied by the amount of cycles in the loop. And so that's gonna be two for the decrement and two for the branch node equal, which gives us two plus four times loops. We also know that the number of cycles that we want is going to be the time delay divided by the CPU period with the correct units. And with those two equations, we can compute the number of loops, which is going to be the time delay divided by the period minus two divided by four. And then I have to add 0.99 to round up because the int function here is going to round down. And the assembler can generate this loop now using the correct number of loops. And at the top here, I've just added some error checking. If I ask for too big of a delay, it's going to error and tell us that we have to switch to the medium delay function. And if I try to do a too small delay, it's also going to error and tell us to use a NUP, for example. So as you can see here, the minimum delay is six cycles. So loops can only start at one here because we're always going to execute this at least one time. So that's gonna be six cycles. And then the maximum is 1026 if loops is 256. And the reason to have various sizes is maybe we want to have a delay without overriding the A or the Y register. And we're pretty happy with just using the X register so we can use the small delay function. Okay, so we can now replace the delay loop here with our new macro. We want to wait 1 30th of a second. So we can just do plus uh, to call the macro, delay medium in milliseconds. And in milliseconds, that's gonna be 1000th divided by 30. And I'm adding that zero here just to make sure that this is a float division and not an integral division. And so as you can see, this simplifies the code greatly. And we can do the same here in our new emulation toggle loop. We want to wait for 200 milliseconds. And there we go. All right, so at this point, we have two diagnostic tests on boot. Number one is we're able to turn the emulation LED off. And number two is checksumming the ROM. Now, earlier on in this series, I started programming the computer by doing a memory test. And I think it would be good to integrate this existing memory test code into the um, post routine here, per on self-test. This way, if a wire comes loose in the breadboard on the memory side, we are notified of it. I'm not gonna go into too many details about this memory test code as I've shown it before in the video. Just for a reminder, this has two steps. The first step is to test the uh, low RAM. So that's the RAM that's next to the ROM in bank zero. And it does that by writing words of data at incrementing addresses and verifying that we can read back what's written correctly. And then it goes on to do exactly the same for the high RAM, that's the 512K chip, does exactly the same thing, except here it has to modify the data bank register in order to access the high RAM. So this should be pretty easy to integrate into the code. The only difference is we use to signify a failure by running the wait instruction that would turn on the wait LED. However, I don't think that's something we can do in the future because we're going to start working with interrupts. Interrupts are going to bring back the computer from sleep. So this is not as reliable. We have started using the emulation LED for diagnostic outputs. And so we can make the emulation LED blink for example, when there is a memory error, we can blink with different patterns to signify different errors. And I think that's gonna work well for the future. So let's do that. 
Okay, so I've integrated the memory test into the main program. Um, you can see here at the end of the checksum, I've added the number three diagnostic, which is test the bank zero RAM. That's exactly the same code that we had before. And then there is diagnostic number four, which is the extended RAM. And this is also exactly the same code that we had before. Then at the end, if nothing has failed, we reset the databank register and continue with the program. And in order to signify the errors, I'm still using the same XCE loop uh, than with the checksum, but I'm doing it with a pattern. So if there is a low RAM error, the pattern is going to be one short blink and then one long blink. And if there is a extended RAM error, the pattern is two short blinks and one long blink. And as you can see, I'm making extensive use of those new delay macros here, which is pretty good. And in terms of the actual program, nothing has changed. So let's try this now. I'm going to compile it and program it. And you can see now that it's still working. Now what I can do is demonstrate some uh, failure modes. So if I unplug a data bus wire, Let's say this one. The computer is not going to be able to execute code on reset. So if I reset, uh, you see that the emulation LED stays on uh, because it's in a weird state. Um, now if I take one of the page address lines, one of the high ones, so that the early code is not touched, and I reset, you can see that we have blinking here, and that's because the checksum of the ROM is not correct. Now if I unplug one of the wires to the low RAM chip and reset, we can see that it's blinking with two short and one long, and that signifies that the low RAM memory test has failed. And finally, if I unplug one of the wires for the extended RAM, you can see that it's blinking with two shorts and one long, and that signifies an extended RAM test failure. That's great. Now, if anything weird happened with those wires on the breadboards, I'll very easily be able to see it. All right, so I think I will end the video here. I think those changes will make for a good improvement to the developer workflow as well as the reliability of this computer. In the next video, I have a number of cleanups and refactorings I've accumulated over time. I want to do, call it a spring cleanup, if you will. So that's gonna be pretty interesting. And then the video after that is going to be about adding interrupts to the 65C816. So I hope you enjoyed this one. If you have any questions or feedback, please let me know in the comments. If you'd like to support this project and help me with the purchase of tools and components to make this computer a reality, you can support me on Patreon. You'll find the link in the description box below. And in any case, I hope to see you in the next video. Goodbye.